Um, I'm very happy to introduce Father Matthew Carnes, uh, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Government at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service here, and he currently serves as Director of the Center for Latin American Studies. His research examines the dynamics of labor and social welfare policy with particular interest in the way societies protect their most vulnerable members, the old, the young, the ill, or injured, and the unemployed. And the rest of his bio with publications and so on is, is in your packet. Uh, this is a great example of um, your willingness to come. We really appreciate it. Uh, bringing together five centers from the, uh, uh, four centers, excuse me, from the, uh, from the School of Foreign Service. So, so thank you. It's really a great pleasure to be with you. Um, today and to be able to think cross centers here. We don't get to do this often enough at Georgetown, so it's great to be with you as, uh, as you're doing this. Um, and uh, as Susan mentioned, my um, background is mainly on social policy and labor policy, but I'm going to speak much more broadly than that today. And what I thought I'd do in this um, just brief time before we kind of go to questions and answers and dialogue is really to try just think about what are a few of the key trends in the region of Latin America that if I were teaching today, I would probably be hitting on. And I think you're going to see all of these stand at the intersection of identity and of community. So identities, many of which have been um, deeply present for uh, millennia, really, but have getting, gotten activated in different times and different ways through time. And then a search for community in which there's full participation and inclusion, which has also been a challenge um, in every region of the world, but um, in particular some, um, sometimes in some ways in Latin America today. So just uh, highlighting what a diverse and changing region this is. Those of you that teach Latin America probably recognize this. Your students probably don't. The common uh, North American probably doesn't. Um, the radical difference between living in Argentina and Mexico is absolutely dramatic. Um, the ways people speak Spanish, the foods they eat, um, even fairly cosmopolitan people I know sometimes think that once you get south of the border, you're mostly talking about something like beans and rice, which would be almost unknown food in Argentina or in Chile. You know, what would you eat there? Beef. You eat lots of beef, especially in Argentina and Uruguay. In uh, Chile, you eat a lot, a lot more root vegetables. Um, so just radically different in terms of foods in terms of culture. Argentina, Uruguay are countries that look much more to Europe than they do to uh, North America. Um, Central America has I mean, such diverse cultures. So you think about the indigenous cultures of a place like Guatemala compared to a place like Honduras, where that's something that's, there's a, you know, there, are, there is diversity, but it's actually much more focused on sort of a, a more mestizo culture and then Afro-Caribbean culture in the north. So there's incredible diversity inside the region, and I think that's rich for your own teaching to help expose some of that diversity and the ways that um, uh, um, change happens inside societies. Um, yeah, just a richness there. Now I want to just highlight a couple things from the news that could, could be very interesting teaching opportunities. So those of you that follow the region know this was just uh, this last uh, Monday, the signing of the peace accords um, in uh, Colombia. Um, Colombia, which has had a decades-long, 40, 50-year uh, um, civil war going on, now finally reaching a moment where there could be peace. And this has been an incredibly challenging process to get to this point. You see the uh, current president, uh, Manuel Santos, uh, Juan Manuel Santos there, and then the uh, leader of the FARC, um, uh, who goes by the nom de guerre, Timochenko, you know, there, as they uh, sign this peace accord with heads of state from around the region. Um, uh, there, uh, John Kerry was there representing the United States. This incredible moment of uh, real, almost unprecedented transformation of the region. When I first started studying Latin America back in the 1980s, it seemed like civil war was just part of the region. And in fact, every country was going, going through long-standing civil wars uh, driven by huge economic inequalities, um, in many cases failure to incorporate indigenous populations. And these seemed to be going ongoing and perennial. And as the region slowly started to move beyond those, um, those uh, conflicts, Colombia was the last holdout, and one that we, even just 15 years ago, could almost call a failed state. You know, there were whole sections of the country that were controlled by the FARC, and the government couldn't ma maintain control. So to get to this point is truly transformational. And if you're looking for opportunities to think about how does social change happen, how does political change happen, this process um, is a, a really foundational one to think about. It's also really helpful if you want to think about comparative peace processes and comparative justice processes. You may know that one of the deep questions is what do you do with former combatants? Um, former combatants that have, in many cases, well-documented human rights abuses. 
how do we address that? And so they've come up with some uh, means of sort of partial amnesties, uh, confessions. If you confess, you're often given a seven-year restricted, um, restricted mobility inside the country, but not given jail terms. Things that are um, uh, um, at the level of crimes against humanity will be prosecuted, and then people will go to jail for this. But what does that look like? What does that look like, and how will this get played out? And especially, how does it get played out now after other countries had their own justice processes before, peace and reconciliation um, uh, uh, processes, whether that's South Africa, whether it's El Salvador, whether it's Argentina, each of which tried to do this in their own way, and people have learned from those processes, and they're both advancing the process, but also in some ways retarding it, as people are concerned about, gee, if there was an amnesty before that later got suspended, as happened in Argentina, as has happened in South Africa in some ways, does that mean now that I'll get prosecuted later even though it's being guaranteed, guaranteed to me now? So deep, deep questions um, from that case. One that both applies at the big level of justice and leadership, but also at the ground level. And I think uh, for teaching, especially to high school students, to think about the real lived experience of combatants in the Colombian Civil War, um, which is, it overlaps a lot with we think of some of the civil wars in Africa and ongoing conflicts in Africa. Child soldiers, uh, female soldiers, some as young as 12 or 14 is probably an exaggeration of the little girl with the gun, but it does show you exactly how um, this has become something that's uh, been born on the, on the shoulders of very young people. And young people now, as you demilitarize, that haven't been in school, that haven't developed, developed careers, how do they then get integrated into society? And they try to write some of this into the peace agreement. How do we now make opportunities for students to get educated and eventually find the right kinds of jobs? The private sector hasn't always been supportive of this, so this is one of the great uh, sort of last um, questions. Throughout the region, there are ongoing challenges of economic um, inclusion. This is a picture of um, Honduras, which you may know was uh, sort of classically you know, one of these uh, countries that in sort of in a, um, a derogatory way was called a banana republic because it depended so heavily on uh, banana exports. And those banana companies were largely U.S. companies that were operating there. Um, and it became the, the dominant um, product sold on world markets until it was undermined by a couple of different processes. One was cheaper um, production in other countries. So a lot of the um, production moved from Central America to Ecuador and then eventually moved also um, to Southeast Asia, some, but especially to um, Ecuador and South America. Wages were lower. You have this race to the bottom as people seek those cheaper wages. But also, a lot of the American companies chose not to rebuild after hurricanes. So part of my own biography, just to give a little background, was working in Honduras right after Hurricane Mitch in 1998. And in 1999, 2000, companies like Chiquita, Dole, they made these decisions about do we rebuild our plantations or do we just let them go? And at that point, production was cheaper in Ecuador, so they just let these go. That leaves young men like this without jobs. Young women who worked in the packing um, uh, operations without jobs. And so what happens next? Well, we know in Latin America, especially Central America, we've seen the rise of youth gangs. Um, youth gangs that are sometimes tied into drug trade. Youth gangs that uh, have an incredible transnational aspect to them. You may know many of the gangs that operate in Central America actually are the products of North America. They're products of uh, the United States. Families that had fled those civil wars back in the 1980s came to Los Angeles, among other places, settled there. As they sort of looked for opportunities and started to interact with society, with society here in the United States, gangs formed. Two of the most famous were on the 13th and 18th streets um, in Los Angeles. And when, we, uh, when uh, those young men would end up committing crimes, we deport them. We don't actually deal with them in our criminal justice system, we deport them. And so we actually sent the two major gangs that now dominate um, uh, Central America back from Los Angeles. And the two biggest gangs you'll see, and I don't know if you can see it in any of the tattoos. Actually, you can. So he has, um, he has a, a 13 tattoo. OK, a 13 or uh, 18 tattoo. And if you go around Central America, when I was living in Honduras, I quickly got used to noticing on buildings which graffiti there was. You want to know what territory you are. Are you in 13th Street or 18th Street territory? Because this is often a matter of life and death um, as you, uh, between these gangs. Young men without jobs, young men uh, now in prison, huge overcrowding inside the prisons of Central America. And really, an unclear, uh, unclear question about how we resolve this issue. Violence inside those, um, uh, those prisons, violence on the streets in terms of impressing students or young people into the gangs, to join the gangs at a very young age. And so we know that's one of the factors that's been fueling migration. 
um, huge wave of migration that actually started to trickle off some as the economy started to improve, but still from Central America where violence is widespread, we see a large number of, uh, of people continuing to migrate. This is the famous train which you may have heard of, La Bestia, they call it the beast. Um, some people call it the train de la muerte, the, the train of death, um, because it's one of the dominant ways that people make their way from Central America, you can see some of the routes here, from Central America all the way up to the United States, a journey of you know, uh, um, a couple thousand miles that often involves a couple, at least a few thousand dollars in payments to coyotes and others that help you get along the way. And then this extremely perilous trip on this train, um, often on the roof, sometimes inside the cars, um, waiting by the side until the passengers jumping aboard. Um, and there are actually some really excellent documentary films about this that you can use. Um, one called La Bestia, which came out just a couple years ago. Um, and tells the story of some uh, young migrants trying to make their way um, to the United States this way. But we know, of course, that migrant uh, um, path is not one that's just Mexicans coming, but of course it's Central Americans coming. It's even now some people coming in from Ecuador, um, some coming from uh, um, uh, West Africa, making their way first through South America and then making their way up. Um, Haitians making their way up that way rather than through Miami coming in. Um, so this is actually becoming a, a path that's used by, by a large number of people, and one that touches on um, our own country's connection with the region. A couple other factors I would emphasize if I were going to be teaching these days. Um, women have played an extremely important role at all levels of society, but unlike the United States, which is yet to, um, to elect a woman to the presidency, Latin America has elected lots of women um, to the presidency, and these are just four of the most recent ones. Um, so Laura Chinchilla, and Chinchilla um, from uh, Costa Rica, Michelle Bachelet um, from uh, Chile, the current sitting president, Joe Marusa, um, the uh, former president of uh, Brazil, who was just uh, um, impeached or removed from office, and then um, uh, uh, Christina Kirchner, the former president of, uh, of Argentina. Now, this is both a really hopeful trend and also a trend that might be going through a little bit of reversal right now inside the region. We see uh, Rousseff um, uh, uh, being impeached. We know how, uh, how traumatic that entire experience has been inside of Brazil in recent days. We'd be happy to talk more about that if you'd like. But even the overall uh, approval ratings of all presidents in the region, but in particular some of the women, have dropped dramatically. So Michelle Bachelet, her first term, was extraordinarily popular. Um, she was the first socialist president of Chile, enacts a host of social programs, seems to be getting ahead of a lot of the, um, the social issues inside of Chile. But then by the time she returns to office, people start um, looking more closely at some of her family ties and accusing her of not quite trumped up, but certainly so they're blowing up um, some uh, family ties to business that then they start to consider something like corruption. She's not able to deliver the same kind of growth that she had before. And so we actually see people turning against her and a rise of student activism. Um, this is student activism inside Chile. Um, the students in Chile are upset by the previous governments, and especially the, the um, uh, military dictatorship's government, uh, rules about education, which emphasized market solutions in education, which said let's, in a sense, privatize uh, a significant portion of our secondary education, and let's uh, uh, um, allow the market to hopefully uh, encourage uh, competition and growth. Well, students now are upset at that. And so students have formed very strong unions. They take over schools. They regularly sit in at schools. That means high schools have been shut down in some cases for months um, in the last few years. Um, and these students have become important political figures, both in high school and college uh, level. Um, some of them are now uh, serving as Congress people inside of Congress. So this kind of student activism, especially if I were teaching students today, I'd want them to think comparatively about how their student activism expresses itself. Do they take to the streets? What do they call for? What are the crucial issues for them? There's also a whole host of issues we can think about in terms of historical development, um, especially if you're doing comparative history. So we can think about the, the, um, the importance of colonial rule and how different the kind of colonial rule that happened inside Latin America was from the kind of settlement, especially small settler communities that happened in North America. So where large land grants were given out by the crown in, um, from Spain, in uh, North America, especially the uh, east coast of North America, we see British uh, settlers primarily coming in and having small, um, small communities that in some cases may have promoted more opportunities for collaboration and democracy in a way that a land grant under the um, direction of a soldier um, or a viceroy couldn't inside of um, Latin America. And that's led to an entrenched 
um, a set of elite families that continue to dominate politics. We can also think about the important um, aspects of indigenous and mixed communities. Um, so inside Latin America, we know that there are uh, important pre-existing indigenous communities, both large ones and small ones, um, vast majority, a vast number of different language groups, concentrated in some ways in uh, Inca civilizations and in the Aztec civilizations in Mexico, the Maya, and Central America. But each of those actually has a tremendous diversity within them. And that identity of Maya identity today is something that's actually being recaptured in a way that even three, a generation or two generations ago, people didn't talk about as much. They talked about being Quiche, they talked about being their local tribe. But now there's this construction in the sense of new, larger identities that can then be organized inside politics, um, inside politics um, locally. And in mixed communities. So I think of the Afro-Caribbean communities inside Colombia, the Afro-Caribbean communities um, on the uh, east coast of Central America, the Garifuna, um, where this incredible uh, uh, group of uh, families that formed actually from escaped slaves, and uh, they welded together both African culture and uh, Latin American culture, Central American culture, in this very um, powerful way. Huge issue in the region. Um, I teach a whole course on this now, on economic inequality. Latin America has had the, um, uh, the poor uh, um, distinction through the last century of being the most unequal region in the world. And what does that mean to be the most unequal region in the world? It doesn't necessarily mean you have most people in poverty, although it has had a large number of people in poverty, often 20, 30, 40, 50% of the population. But what it really means is the separation between the poorest and the richest is high, with very little middle class, with very little middle class. And if in the middle of the 20th century, a few countries, Argentina, Mexico, um, uh, Brazil, were able to start to develop a middle class, we've actually seen that eroded some in recent years, especially in most recent economic crises. And this leads to a continued dominance at the political level and at the business level by a small elite, and then a large mass of people that are excluded, often left in what we call the informal sector. So they work in jobs that are not registered with the government. They don't have access to health care. They don't have access to pensions. Um, they have limited access to education. So this lack of incorporation due to economic inequality is a huge issue in the region. And then finally, I'd highlight uh, the trend of sort of a transition from military rule, which was so dominant in the middle part of the 20th century, 60s, 70s, 80s, which seemed, um, seemed to be present in many, many countries, to now a, an important return to democracy where we see democracy spreading, but an imperfect democracy. A democracy in which elections are held, but we don't always see alternation of power between governments. That's one of the way we often describe, uh, often define full democracy as not only having elections, but the opponent can, can win occasionally, the outsider can win. We don't always see outsiders winning. We see control of the media, um, places like Venezuela, uh, places like Mexico, often the media uh, dominated by a few elite voices. So is the promise of democracy, will that be fully uh, lived out? And then finally, just to highlight maybe a couple of issues, and then I'd love to open it up just to questions and comments and things. And I'm just trying to highlight a few key trends, um, is to think about how the development of the region happens. I mentioned to you the different patterns of land grants. So this shows actually the vice royalties. The vice royalties, so these are grants given by the king, uh, by the crown in Spain. Um, <laughs> to various governors, uh, generally soldiers, um, and their families, um, which then meant a dominance and a very hierarchical dominance inside the region led to some of those um, concentrations of wealth among elite families. And there are lots of studies these days that do comparative development between those land grants, those huge land grants in, 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 uh, in uh, Spanish America, with the difference with British America and British territories, but we don't see that same style of, of land grant giving. In fact, we see small settlers forming small communities that then, in, in some cases, start to create a kind of organic democracy. And we can ask ourselves, is that sort of baked in from the beginning? Is, is democracy fostered in a way by this early settler pattern? Or is there something else going on there that either promotes or uh, prevents um, democracy? As I mentioned, we can also think about the independence movements and how those happen in the 1800s especially. How do we see uh, uh, um, uh, uh, communities gathering together to call for recognition of themselves as separate countries and just highlighting the differences among them can be fascinating. One thing I wanted to point out today was thinking a little bit about um, dominance of production, um, especially what we used to call monocultures, right? So we often think about having a single resource upon which you're dependent for your development. 
And many of these countries, initially it was natural resources, but now you can see that's changing dramatically. So this is Central America today. And you'll remember I pointed out to you, uh, and you can see clothing and shoes in Mexico as being one of the dom its, dominant, um, uh, its dominant export. You can see coffee from Guatemala, coffee from uh, Nicaragua, uh, bananas still um, uh, uh, um, from Costa Rica. Um, but apparel is becoming more and more important, and especially in Honduras. What happened in Honduras after the banana plantations moved out? Well, uh, multinational corporations moved in, setting up what we call maquilas there, maquiladoras in Mexico is what they call them. These assembly plants where you bring the raw um, ta uh, um, uh, cloth and goods and assemble them into the garments we wear, um, and then you can sell those to uh, the United States. Who works in those apparel um, uh, firms in, in uh, Honduras? Mostly young women. So mostly young women. Why? Well, it seems that they're easier um, uh, um, for many employers to exploit, to push harder. Um, they have more nimble fingers, people will tell you, and they're able to assemble more quickly. Um, they're usually only able to work in these jobs from about 15 to about 20, 25. They're often uh, subject to pregnancy tests and signs of the inside of and then fired if they seem to be pregnant. Um, but this creates this strange and new and evolving social dynamic where women, young women, become the breadwinners for their families for a short period of time. This subverts a lot of social hierarchy, and especially if the men are unemployed, and if even their fathers are unemployed, what does this do to the social hierarchy? It's been really profoundly unsettling, and then we know the abuses that can happen as well. So, this sort of transformation of the region, and from uh, 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 bananas now to coffee, we see how this is changing the region. You can see here South America too, and how it's changed. If traditionally Argentina's export, and they would uh, be devastated to look at this today, to see that now soybeans is their main export, they have incredible pride about their beef, but now it's only Uruguay whose uh, primary export is beef. Now soybeans have taken over. Soybeans being produced for, mostly, uh, for China which is uh, becoming one of the dominant markets for, Central, for South America. So we thought for a long time about Latin America being tied a lot to the United States. Now we're seeing it being a regional player and tying more into uh, interaction uh, with China. And let me just highlight one last piece before, uh, before we open this up. The region, as I've mentioned, has had to deal with this um, ongoing inequality. Informal labor, so the lack of incorporation of everyone into the um, uh, state-run social system, but it has been a, a, a seabed of very innovative policies. And just to highlight one of these, just to highlight one of these, there's a policy called Bolsa Familia in Brazil. And it's what we call a conditional cash transfer program. Brazil and Mexico, uh, um, in the late 1990s, started to pioneer a new kind of social program that was geared especially towards those people that were in the informal sector, people that hadn't been paying taxes, people that hadn't been incorporated by having a, um, their job registered with the government. And it said, let's see if we can help them in future generations by encouraging them to get their kids to school, encouraging them to have their children vaccinated. And the way we'll do that is not by just delivering vaccinations for free or school for free, we'll actually pay people a small amount, a small amount each month, the idea was to cover the opportunity cost, that cost that would be incurred if you had to drive your kid to school, actually you know, drive your kid to take the bus to school, if you needed to take time off work to make sure they got the immunization. So it's about, in many cases, $20 or $30 a month that they give to families when they ensure that their children are in school and ensure that they're getting their vaccinations. And it's accomplished through these um, ID cards, actually ATM cards, which allow the government to make a direct transfer to families as they carry out these good things. And the idea is both in the present moment, it means the family will eat better and be a bit more secure financially. And in the long term, there will be greater human capital because these students will be healthier and better educated. That's the long term goal of this. It has had results. We see over a year of uh, increase in uh, education, students staying in school longer. But there's an open question of how good that school is, right? If schools aren't all that, uh, that aren't all that um, fine-tuned or high, uh, or high um, quality, and maybe you're just having another year without actually getting any additional gain. So one of these great opportunities that can be further explored um, in the region. So we all leave it there. I just want to highlight a few issues and ideas that are floating around inside the region, things I would probably talk about if I were going to be teach this, and then just open it up for uh, questions or comments or ideas. So, Scott Colts, I'm teaching Latin American Studies at, at Roosevelt High School. Um, I was just overwhelmed by all the ideas. <laughs> yeah. Very long list of things that now would integrate into an already full curriculum. Yes. Um, but it's great. Um, I was wondering, 
you mentioned this on a couple, but where do you think maybe are a couple of the main areas where we can connect it back to, uh, obviously, immigration, love HDI and things like that, um, or some natural areas, but maybe some key areas or thematic areas where you, uh, you think you can make good U.S. Uh, connections or connected like the, the students' lives? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think the first one I jump at is inequality. Okay, so uh, economic inequality has been growing in the, in the United States pretty tremendously. We finally, 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 after 30 years of it growing, this last year we saw a tiny tick down. So, you know, some people say, well, we don't have to worry. No, 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 let me tell you. We're still like, I mean, it's such a different place than we were 30 years ago. And what do I mean by that? It means that most of the gains of growth in the United States over the last 30 years, so we're talking about like 95% of the gains, have gone to the top 10%, really to the top 1%. Um, and that's, you know, sometimes people say, oh, that's politicized. No, 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 that's just the data. Okay, that's just the data, okay? You can talk about if that's good or bad, but that's just the data. And in fact, in the United States, we're approaching the levels of inequality that we've seen in Latin America. And so to think about what has that meant for Latin America in terms of social unrest, um, for the inclusion of people to have access to education, um, to represent themselves in political parties. I think there's just a whole lot of things you can do that would be very, very interesting around um, economic inequality. That uh, would be one, one area. Um, another, I think, is this idea of how do you forge identity in diverse communities? Um, the prime example for this, for me, is uh, Mexico. So Mexico, which has a whole host of indigenous identities inside of it, actually speaking many, many different languages. Um, and it has this uh, really protracted and large effort in the 1940s, 1920s, 30s, 40s, to construct a single national identity. Um, my favorite example of this is if you go to the square at Plaza de Loco, which is uh, what they call the Plaza de las Tres Culturas. There was a massacre there in 1968. But it's marked by this, uh, this uh, um, sign that says, historically, this place, which has an Aztec temple with a Catholic church, and the Ministry of Foreign Relations, that's why it's the Tres Culturas, right? They're all there um, in the same square. There's this great sign there that says, in this square, uh, Cuauhtémoc, who was the Aztec um, leader, um, fell to uh, um, Cortés. Um, but then it says this, it says, this was neither a victory nor a defeat, but the painful birth of a new mestizo Mexican nation. It's this very concerted effort to say, oh, out of multiple identities, we can make this new one. And we know it's not completely delivered on because there still is discrimination against indigenous peoples inside of Mexico, especially those in, in Chiapas in the south, right, Michoacan. But this is at least the promise that you see people trying to make and trying to construct. Or you think about like Enable Morales, right, who then, you know, as the first indigenous leader of uh, Bolivia, starts to draw on uh, his own indigenous roots and drawing different indigenous groups to the conversation. When we think about what is United States identity? What does it mean to be an American? You know, we sometimes use that word that way, right? What does it mean to be an American? Well, how do we grapple with that here in the United States? And then how can we compare that to what Latin Americans have done trying to do that as well? Might be another place I jump in. You know, you talked about clothing in Central America. You know, the, so many of these colonial patterns, people have the raw, the raw materials where the, the money really is, is in the finished product. So right. most of our chocolate today is in Ghana and the Ivory Coast, but Hershey's makes a candy bar, so we paid a dollar for a one ounce candy bar for. Right. I also, years ago, Bolivia has half the world supply of lithium. And he promised, you know, we're going to stop just selling this to other people, and we're going to learn how to make lithium batteries mm -hmm. and bring the high paying jobs to our our countrymen. And, and I don't know if you're in your travels back and forth, how has that worked out in Bolivia in the last five or ten years? I well, I'll speak more to Bolivia um, with hydrocarbons. So they have um, uh, tons of natural gas. And he uh, nationalized that. But then, unlike a lot of other leaders that have then you know, nationalized and completely squandered it on a few programs, he's actually been putting it in sort of this bank account for these kind of conditional cash transfer programs to really make them sustain through time. And it's actually been highly, highly effective. Um, he's one of the few and people, it, it, there are a lot of people who would like to say he's, he's, he, that he would be a mess, but they can't say that because he actually has been effective in what he's done with this. Um, uh, Chile actually is another example. So they have copper, right? And they uh, historically set up sort of a strong box with their extra revenues that they made when copper prices were high. So that then later they could pay down either debt or needs. So when the earthquake hit them, uh, just a few years ago, 2010, 11, something like that, um, they were able to actually pay that down using the, the, the surplus they had saved through the years. They have this economic commission that actually oversees it. And when prices are above expectations, they have to save it. And when they're below expectations, they can pull from that fund. Um, so there are, are ideas we could use resources well. 
And that might be two, two rare exceptions, right? Uh, generally, we don't, uh, countries don't use resources as well. Um, Venezuela and Mexico are both examples of oil that have really squandered and misused their, their resources. Um, so when you have that much wealth, you can pull straight out of the ground. Sometimes you don't invest enough in further research and development, further exploration. Um, neither of them uh, did that in the long term, so it meant that Mexico's oil revenues throughout the 20th century fall through time rather than going up. They should have been more productive, but they don't become that. And then Venezuela, of course, was using it for all sorts of political purposes, right? Both for social programs at home, but also for allies abroad. Cuba was getting a, a huge amount of oil, more or less for free. Um, oil was being given to Argentina for political reasons, so there was this way that it wasn't used well. Um, so, yeah, this could be a real, uh, a real problem and issue. And then just to come back to um, Quechua. Quechua is taking on more, it's, something, it's getting more state, um, state support, um, but it still isn't at the point where it's you know, universally used or become on, on a par with, um, with Spanish. And I think that's a hard thing to recover completely. Um, Nevertheless, there is a much greater respect for indigenous identity and indigenous rights. And he's been a pretty transformational leader there um, without going quite off the deep end that people were in that he might when he first came in. Okay. Who else has a question or a comment? Yeah, Jeff. Ideas? Uh, on that point, I was going to just suggest that, you know, one other interesting thing with that is how Cuba kind of trades its resources with other trades, it's medical uh, advancements and other things with Venezuela for oil, and the, the kind of resource exchange that people use that aren't formal exports. That's right. No, that's actually one of the really fascinating aspects of what Cuba has done. If you don't know this, Cuba trains this incredible group of doctors. They have more doctors than they can use. And so they treat them as an export. They, they send them out to, uh, to other countries. When I was working in Honduras after the hurricane, we got a, 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 um, a shipment, if you will, of um, Cuban doctors who were spectacular. They were some of the most highly educated people I've ever met because when you have an oversupply of doctors, what do you do? You just keep training them. So they were all, you know, they all had two or three specializations. So some of them would be like an OBGYN and a neurologist, right? Like, really? You know, like, you know, uh, you know, they'd just be like these great mixes. And you talk to them and they'd be really well read and have just I mean, really fantastic ideas and, and really were able to do a lot. Now that's caused some conflict inside a number of the countries that receive them. Because as you know, doctors in each country are usually seen as highly trained professionals who have a sense of um, wanting to control the market that they operate in. And they do it not simply because they want to be, you know, sort of, this is my thing, but because they really think that they're the best at doing it. But when the Cuban doctors come in, all of a sudden start going places that the local doctors don't want to go, or charging less than the local doctors charge, and in fact, in many cases, nothing. Um, that's something that really upsets the equilibrium inside these economies. So there's been lots of, actually, doctor protests um, where Cuban doctors have come. Um, and you, you might be surprised all the places they go. Brazil has a ton of Cuban doctors. And it's not just the countries that are in sort of the uh, direst of circumstances. They've sent them all over. Uh, I've used a documentary as well called Harvest of Empire. And it focuses a lot on, for those of you familiar with it, um, with the U.S. involvement in uh, Central America and the Caribbean. And, and it's been very powerful uh, when I was in the classroom because a lot of my students were from El Salvador. So for other students who were born and raised in the United States and they're not familiar with why these people are here, it explains it very clearly in the film. And before the film, we do an activity from Teaching for Change where they take on the roles of people in the film. So when they're watching it, they, they understand it more deeply because, they, oh, that's me. Or they, they were Jimmy Carter or they were Archbishop Romero. So it really helps them to understand uh, why a lot of their classmates and their families come to the United States. And they also understand the U.S. involvement and, and understand really that people are fleeing these areas, not because the United States is this great place to be, but people are just escaping because of the involvement or the, um, the actions of the U.S. government in, in some cases. Yeah. No, that's really helpful to highlight. And, and I think it's one of the tricky things to know how to expose uh, uh, high school students to is that the U.S. has a very checkered history and actually a really negative history through um, most of the 20th century in terms of wanting to impose uh, not always uh, democracy, but leaders that we liked. Uh, we were often quite content with people that were autocratic if they did things that we thought were anti-communist, would, would support our, our side in the Cold War. And that had huge social implications. It, it, fomented um, ongoing civil wars, uh, fomented and supported human rights abuses in some cases, taught some of those human rights abuses in our own school of the Americas. Um, so this is something that we bear a, a real responsibility for. And I can see how great that would be then for your students to be able to see 
the legacy or the history of the, of the students that are now in the classroom. Because I imagine the ones that you have in your classroom today were born here in the United States. You know, 20 years ago, you would have actually had students that had come from um, El Salvador during the period of the Civil Wars. Now, if they're coming, it's more that they're coming through this sort of ongoing economic um, exclusion, uh, the ongoing threat, the violence and, um, from the gangs, and that's what's pushing people now. So it's a different, a different moment, but both are really, really important. I had one student who was actually um, born in the United States, her family from El Salvador, but after the lesson she came up to me, she said she'd never heard of that story wow. before because her parents, I mean, a lot of times parents, they don't want to talk about it because it was a very difficult story to tell their children. So she said after that, she went home and talked to her parents about it and began to learn about the sacrifices her parents and her other, other family members made for her to live the life that she's living now. So uh, that's, that's really important. And you know, maybe just to highlight one last piece of that. People that now find themselves in the United States, actually just as people in, in El Salvador, during the civil conflict, often families divided. So it wasn't that everybody in the family was on one side or the other. And you very well could have had uh, a son or a nephew that was fighting as part of the army, and then there were a uh, uh, side that was fighting you know, in, in the, um, in, among the revolutionaries, you know, on the FMLN. And so now, when you talk about this, you think about things like human rights abuses. What may be that people either saw or were involved in those things, um, and they, they don't want to talk about it now with good reason, right? But how do we heal communities after that? It's one of the questions Colombia is trying to ask right now, and it's more recent, right? But El Salvador is kind of somewhat under the under the surface now, but still lingering there, and it can be a real uh, source of, of conflict and growth when we can talk about it. Ancestry.com sure. has advertisements. You send your other companies have it too. DNA, you send it in, it tells you who you are. Well, it tells you about your background. Right. Right, genetic background. Right, but I find it interesting increasingly that seems to be advertised. Yeah. Rather than they're assuming we're all Americans. Oh, yeah, no, I think that's, well, we know that American is very constructed identity, right? One that's both has evolved through time in some ways, and one that uh, involves very few people as being even what we could call indigenously American. If we want to go far enough back, nobody is indigenously American. Um, uh, you know, even you know, those who we now call indigenous uh, arrived from Africa and sort of a long migration. And so if anything, I think what, what ancestry uh, um, exploration does is gives us a sense of, on the one hand, our commonality, that there's something very basic about human beings. And it also shows us the incredible complexity because there is no purity of, of race. In fact, even race is a constructed idea. Um, it's one that um, you know, is, is mentioned early on because people have phenotypic differences, right? Differences in skin color, differences in heights, and certain physical characteristics. But at the genetic level, it doesn't exist. It's not something that's meaningful in any sense. It is something, though, that the academy, especially universities in the 19th century, went to great pains to defend, in part because it defended the economic interests they were giving money to universities. And so they were willing to sort of come up with sort of pseudo-scientific explanations for that. But now it's something that doesn't have much, uh, that doesn't have any genetic characteristic to it. And so what it does, I think, show each of us our own convoluted history, where we can say, well, fine, this real mix of people that have somehow met and interbred through history in this profoundly rich and uh, even messy way and maybe it helps us cling a little less to this idea that I'm an American and they're not. Um, that's just, that's a very constructive idea. And I want to thank you very much. This was an extremely rich presentation. Um,